Joel, and, and uh, I'm delighted to be here. And um, before we get going, I think I've got a, a slide to click and a video to show. Ideas. They're born when two separate things come together to form something new. Incredible, fun, even magical. And the results? Well, the results can change the world. Like this crazy idea 20 years ago. What if we brought together software and the internet, business and philanthropy, companies and customers? These ideas are why we're here today as one powerful community. And yet our future is brighter than our past. Our dreams are bigger. Our impact stronger. Our potential limitless. Just imagine what we can bring together, together. Let's bring dreamers and doers together. Learners and leaders, coders and closers, trailhead and trailblazers, Astro, Cody, Cloudy, and Einstein. You and your future. Let's bring companies and customers together. How about the right message to the right person at the right time? Let's bring customer and 360 together. Salesforce and Tableau, AI and OMG. What about retailers and shoppers, hospitals and patients, insurance and reassurance, small business, big dreams. Let's bring trust, customer success, innovation, and equality together. Equal work and equal pay, shareholders and stakeholders, sea level and sea level. Doing well and doing good. Together, we can make the world a better place because business is the greatest platform for change. We just need to let our ideas come together. Excellent. <clears throat> so there you go, a quick video to uh, warm you all up. Um, Simon Mulcahy, Chief Innovation Officer at Salesforce. And um, what I wanted to do today was talk about change being effectively, this is the slowest any of you will ever experience change ever again. It is only gonna get faster. Now before I sort of d dive into that, and um, Brendan was telling me that a lot of this conference is about kind of making change happen, the how of change, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that. Um, I do want to pause, I've, I've met so many people since this is my first time in Cleveland and um, I've been blown away by, by this incredible city. I went to the Rock and Roll Museum, which is amazing. Uh, you should all go there, drank your beer. I met some amazing people, um, many of whom are Salesforce customers. And to all of you who are Salesforce customers, thank you, because uh, it's frankly you who are building this incredible company that's, uh, that I'm, I'm part of. Now, um, Salesforce, for those of you who don't know it, one slide on that, and then I'm uh, off Salesforce, but we started effectively helping people sell. When we started 20 years ago, it was basically forecasting and contact management delivered in the cloud. But over 20 years of listening to customers and, and feeding off what they need, we've built this platform, which is effectively focused on doing one thing, and that is putting the customer in the middle of the business. And everything I'm gonna talk about is about how that is the fundamental shift that's happening in every industry, and getting that right is, um, requires a little bit more than just buying some technology. You've got to think about what the DNA of your business is and how you put the customer in the middle. And then when you've got the customer in, in the middle of, of, uh, of your business and in the center of your mind, then you can use these new technology tools to supercharge the experiences that you deliver to them, create amazing buying experiences, service experiences, et cetera. And that's what this one platform does. So the data from everywhere around your business can be plumbed into, so you can create a single view of your customer, and every single touch point, every single experience that you're delivering to your customers can, can, be, uh, can be seen across your whole organization. Um, so that's what we do, and we call that platform customer uh, 360. But <clears throat> the, back to my whole point earlier, my scary kind of uh, statement that change will never be slower than it is today. I'm just gonna let that marinate let you marinate in that point, because it is a, a profound statement. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but it's maybe worth starting with the fact that we are all experiencing um, a major revolution. We call it, as Salesforce, the fourth industrial revolution, a term coined by the World Economic Forum. And kind of once every hundred years, or at least so in the past, there have been these major changes in society which have driven enormous change to how people live, how they work, how they communicate, how they interact, uh, and how they, uh, and how, and everything, the way that society is designed. The steam revolution, the electricity revolution, computing, uh, and the era of, of uh, mainframe computing. But now we're entering this fourth industrial revolution where everything and everyone is connected. And that has massive implications for us and massive implications for business. Because there's this incredible flood of new technology which is, is making its way into our, our daily lives. And the third industrial revolution which brought computing to the world, that also had a lot of technology. But it took decades for that technology the mainframe, client server and PC and web 1.0 to make its way into our lives and make its way into truly impacting um, our, our business. However, these new fourth industrial revolution technologies are having an explosive impact almost immediately and they're all combining and we're only seeing some of them. Some of them are just on the edge of happening. 5G genomics um, and quantum computing are not quite there yet but we're already beginning to experience just how powerful web 2.0, cloud mobile, IoT, uh, artificial intelligence, many of the things that, that, that Thomas just talked about earlier, and just the sheer impact that they're gonna have. So of course, many leaders want to take all of these technologies and leverage them into their businesses. Um, but it's not, the, it's not the CEO and the leader of the company that is king anymore, it is the customer. And it's what we call a customer revolution. And these customers are calling the shots. And these customers, your customers, or you as a customer, you are expecting different things. You are expecting uh, in experiences which are truly personal, truly tailored to your, to your needs, where choice is curated so that you don't have to go through the effort of getting what you want. It's really easy to, for you to get exactly what you want when you want it. Service is contextual and it's voice directed, and it's easy to get access to, to information through bots, through agents who've got dynamic scripts, through conversational UIs, and that the service level, the service layer is everywhere. You can interact with the world wherever you are and get whatever you want, whenever you want it, um, and whatever you want. And that's, that is the new world. These are the new rules that basically customers are throwing at the feet of business. And uh, of course, what this is doing, it's actually changing what growth models look like in every industry. Historically, and many of you will, will remember, and you still see the vestiges of this today, big used to beat small. It was the incumbent who ruled. Now, pretty much because of the internet, and we're kind of the third industrial revolution, fast beats slow. Those organizations that can leverage the internet can go faster, and they, they're winning now in most industries. But the leaders in most industries today are those who are really beginning to realize that this is a race for relevance and that the winners will be those who are able to deeply understand what the customer wants, the customer's context, and can pivot their organization to serve the needs of the customer as agile as, as, in as agile as possible a way. So these are the new kind of uh, growth models for every industry. And most companies are not there. Most companies are not leveraging these new technologies, despite the fact that consumers expect it and are demanding it now. So I say all of this, but what are the, what are, what are the signals that any of this is true? Well, all I wanna do is walk you through five kind of key things, key major trends that, that we're seeing which completely uh, bear out what I'm saying and are uh, awakening call to you. Services, the product, tasks are becoming effortless, everyone is in service, the future is more human, and ethics are, frankly, uh, no longer optional. So first of all, service is the product. And what we mean by this is that before, you used to be able to sell a product, your ability to build a product and take it to market, distribute it to market at scale, was effectively all you needed to win. And if you had size and incumbency, you won. 
We live in a world today where your product is only one component of the experience you're delivering to your customers. And if you only focus on your product, you will fail. You need to focus on the service. So the service is becoming a much more important part of your overall, overall engagement with your customers. So look at what's going on in the automotive industry. Before, it used to be about selling cars. It was easy, just sold cars. But now it's becoming kind of crazy. The, the cost of a car is, is enormous, and it sits down on your driveway, mostly depreciating. So most car companies are now exploring what car as a service is. Look at what uh, Volvo is doing, what Audi is doing, uh, and what Daim Daimler Group have been doing with BMW, where they've been investing billions in exploring and coming up with this whole car as a service model. So you don't own a specific model of a Volvo. You have a subscription to Volvo, and you can change out your car according to your needs. The same thing is happening in a different way in insurance. So we're moving from insurance, waking up and going, hold on a minute, we're just selling indemnity products, to insurance companies now moving into a much more service-based engagement, prevention as a service. So insurance companies focusing on not selling you a health insurance policy for when you're ill, but actually being there and helping you uh, live a healthier lifestyle. Not selling you a car insurance policy for when you crash, but actually helping you drive uh, more safely or not being there for when your business folds with um, a business uh, insurance, but helping you with, with business continuity and helping your business be more successful. AXA is a good example of this. They spent billions in a, a program called AXA Next to go and explore these new types of experiences. And all you have to do is look at the whole InsureTech um, universe to see just the sheer volume of effort and, uh, around uh, this, this shift in the insurance industry. But it's also going on in retail. There, it's simple. It's the move from transactions, selling a product one by one by one, transactions, to now subscriptions. Two types of subscriptions here, purchase as a service and rental as a service. Nike came up just earlier this year with uh, Nike Adventure Club because parents find it difficult to get out and regularly buy their children shoes because of work and other commitments. So why not Nike just uh, provide a subscription that you quarterly or, or monthly can have these shoes delivered with not just the shoe, but a whole set of other interactive experiences to make it fun for your children. And that's the same as Stitch Fitch for clothing, Dollar Shave Club, Bottomless, which measures your coffee at home and, and just reorders your coffee when it's getting low, Brandless, Lip Monthly. The explosion of purchases of service in retail is really, really interesting trend to watch. But the same thing is also happening in uh, rental as a service. People are like, I don't want to own this, I just need to use it a couple of times and then I'll give it back. And, and obviously Rent the Runway has been doing this with ball gowns. Now Rent the Runway has, has uh, extended into, frankly, the whole um, uh, uh, closet and actually has partnered with Nordstrom. Now they're partnering with hotels and there are a whole horde of copycats out there in the marketplace. A new one that was announced recently is Newly, which is Urban Outfitters uh, and, and all of the brands and Urban Outfitters for $88 a month, you have access to their whole portfolio. So this whole movement from transaction to subscription in the retail world is a real, uh, a real factor. Data is also becoming a fundamental for every organization to get its arms around. And what we're seeing definitely happen is organizations take this really, really seriously. So just look at um, Prime moving into Whole Foods. That's a really, really big deal because now Amazon is actually capturing um, consumer data and consumer uh, information about these individual consumers uh, in the context of their grocery shopping. And when you combine that with 20 years of Amazon shopping uh, history on each of these consumers, that is an enormous amount of insight that Amazon has on uh, people's shopping proclivities. And what that makes it a very, very difficult job to a very difficult place to be in this industry unless you're beginning to compete and leverage data more effectively. Netflix was born in 1997 as a mail order DVD company, but they have basically fundamentally moved to embracing data by getting closer to a customer in real time. They can see almost exactly how you're watching those movies and TV shows, and that allows them an enormous set of insights through that data, and that allows them to create the business that they have today which is basically making TV shows and movies uh, and putting them online. Adidas also, they made sneakers and they sold them through wholesalers, but they realized that if they could get close to the end customer 
online, they could use that data to make much, much better um, products and also figure out how to sell more effectively in each market. And now their digital channel is by far their fastest growing. Um, another really example, a fun example of this is uh, Wink, Wine, Inc. They, were, they are a company that sells wine online, but what they would do is they would um, effectively use recommendations to sell commonly uh, known wines. But what they started to do was take all of the information, all of the data that they collected, and effectively um, mix their own uh, wines and sell them according to each individual user's uh, own needs. Their business tripled almost overnight. The power of data in allowing you to create more personal, tailored experiences is fundamental to the future. And that means that in order to be relevant, you've really got to compete by understanding the customer's job to be done. What's the customer actually trying to do? Not what products they're trying to buy, what they're actually trying to do, and then delivering really differentiated experiences to make that real. And the big question to all of you here is, are you ready for this? Are you ready to do this? The second thing is tasks are becoming um, effortless. And, and what that means is bots connecting dots, understanding what your needs are, and almost solving your need before you even knew that you had a problem. And, um, and you can see this everywhere now, especially with the emergence of and the improvement of IoT technologies. So now, for example, a car uh, can self-heal. Tesla, plugged in in your, in your uh, garage overnight, is self-healing. It's got the, getting the latest upgrade. And yet, if you've got an old car, you've got to go through a recall. You've got to take it back to the garage. They've got to fix it. Then they'll tell you when it's ready, and you go and pick it up again. How crazy is that amount of effort compared to you just auto-upgrading in your garage overnight? Bot assistance. Now, a trim is one a good example here, but there are many of these services that are now appearing globally. And the whole idea is that you give Trim your details of your subscriptions, and a bot, on behalf of you, goes and constantly negotiates and finds uh, cheaper deals for you. Invisible banking. Now we're seeing a much bigger focus on service design across financial services companies. But the whole idea of autom almost automatically removing the tasks that you have to do, the transactions of banking are just evaporating. So when you walk into a, a store, you go into an Amazon Go, you pick up the product you want, and then all you have to do is walk out. Well, that, that's Amazon Go, but just think about Uber and Lyft and how you put in your credit card once and you never have to pay or go through the transaction of paying again. Simply when you go to the app store, you, all you do is a, a facial recognition and then that's the same as payment. And pre-approved loans and other experiences are all ways in which the financial services industry is moving a, away from making you do a transaction. Why do you have to do a transaction? It should just be taken off your plate. So in order in this world to compete, how can you be really laser focused on understanding the context that your customer is in and really delivering almost proactively on what their needs are, even before you, they know it? And again, the question for you all is, are you ready for this world? Because it's here now. Um, the third thing is the service kind of world of the past was you had a department and it was called service. Today, every single person in your organization is in service. And what that means is that, and the, what we're seeing that really, really kind of underlines this point is much, many organizations now are looking at those service interactions and they're realizing that they don't sell products anymore. These companies, you all sell experiences, and your product is just one part of those experiences, and they need to be designed. And organizations are taking that very seriously with things like design thinking. And they're and not thinking from you know, the, the, the selling experience, but the buying experience. This means, this means not from the company out, but thinking from the outside in. And those organizations that spend time designing those experiences experience massive improvements in customer satisfaction, employee productivity, uh, and, and obviously re uh, revenue increases. We're also seeing this inside the organization. Typically, back office functions like software development um, are actually need to be up there and, and engage with customers as well. You can't test products. You can't test experiences that you're designing in software unless you're actually experiencing it from the point of view of the customer themselves. This is the DevOps handbook. Um, 
a, a Bible of, of the kind of software developer of today. And this is a good quote, which kind of underlines that point. Um, the service workforce, that department I kind of referred to earlier, is definitely becoming much more uh, strategic in its own right. And anybody, if you ask them as an agent, a service agent, they will tell you, or most of them will tell you that their job is becoming much, much more strategic. And look at any organization that is actually overperforming by industry, by region, and you'll see that the majority of the people in service in those businesses are focused on complex customer questions, whereas the underperformers, not so much so. So again, in order to compete, you've got to have this idea that, that customer service is not a department. Your whole organization, your whole organization, including your ecosystem, is aligned as one team around your customer and serving the customer with everything that your organization and ecosystem has uh, in support of their or your customer's needs. Are you ready for this? The fourth kind of big meta trend is what we we'll really describe as the future is um, more human. And, and that's definitely more the case now as all of this automation is great, but what it should do is reduce the amount of uh, effort that your employees are spending on mundane tasks so that your employees are focusing on more of the value added, more human uh, interaction uh, moments. And um, a great example of this is T-Mobile. And they've come from a long way behind in the, in the kind of telco world to be regarded at least for the last two years, as number one for service in the telco world. And what they did was they created this whole concept called team of experts. They took people in sales, service, and technology and put them together in these teams of experts, focused on geography, serving groups of 20,000 customers. And then these teams themselves became this really, really cool like um, team of experts, like it says. But it, what it meant was that that the team would solve the customer's um, problems together in a really highly energetic way. They had a big, they've had a massive spike in their NPS on the back of this. Absenteeism has gone down. Performance across the whole business has gone up as a result of this. It's a very, very powerful way of rethinking how your people act as a team in front of the customer. Uh, and by the way, that's kind of open source for you to, 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 to leverage as well. What we're also seeing is that people who are typically regarded as service agents are being regarded now much more not as a, as a cost center, but as a profit center. So here's a good example. KLM, which is the Dutch uh, airline in Europe, um, uses AI to basically field about 120,000 texts a week. Mundane tasks that normally a human would have done. Now they're taken off the table so that those individuals spend their time focusing on value-added tasks which is effectively generating millions for KLM. And, um, and we're also seeing technology being used to augment the power of the people that you have talking to customers. Now those tools, Cogito is a, a good partner of Salesforce's, and what they do is they monitor all service interactions and they score it based on sentiment and tone, and they tell you exactly how to engage with the customer based on their tone and sentiment. What that does is it creates a much, much more effective communication uh, between human and uh, on your side and, and uh, individual on, on, the, on the customer side. What we're also seeing is leaders and um, uh, hiring managers much more aware now um, that these new technologies require you to think about the skills of the team and the imperative for training and for reskilling. And this is going to become an ever more important part of every business leader's uh, reality as, uh, as time moves on and these technologies become more available. And of course, different industries, there's different, different kind of uh, sense of urgency around this issue. But training and reskilling are, are fundamentals. And in this new world, in order for you to compete, you've got to be leveraging data and technology to really make it as easy as possible for every employee to make it really easy to understand exactly what the customer needs and what the customer's context is. And the question is, are you able to do that today? Are you ready for this world? Because your customers are demanding it. The final kind of big meta trend is, is around ethics. And, um, and this is a, a, and I'm sure that you'll, you can just have to look in the, in the, um, in the media and, and see it frankly in the streets sometimes. But we really at Salesforce believe that the 
that business is the greatest platform for change, and yet most businesses are just focused on making money, and yet our whole planet is going down the plug hole. We've got about 10 years left before we've, we've really just destroyed our uh, environment. And so we're seeing this shift from people just focus purely on their shareholders to now thinking more broadly about all stakeholders, shareholders, employees, customers, partners, even the environment as a shareholder. And it's not just the youth who are, but who are beating the drum. Business leaders are also standing up and being counted on this one now. And this is the business uh, roundtable uh, recently announced um, their focus on stakeholder um, capitalism. Um, we're also seeing organizations individually kind of understand just the need for true transparency. Uh, There's a good example here with, um, with Apple, who just acknowledged the, the role, uh, their role in tech addiction, how much time we all spend on, uh, on, their, on our phones. And so now they, they make that real by reflecting back to you your usage pattern. Um, we're also seeing the rise of values-driven services, that people who have values-driven services create more value. So Loop is a good example of sustainable services, ways of making it easier for you to provide sustainable services. We're seeing the growth of, of ESG funds, social responsible uh, investing, over 400 billion in the next 10 years. And we're seeing more and more organizations give back. Um, so all these are important trends. And so in order for you to compete in this world, do you really have that transparency with your customers uh, around your ethical behavior? And are you ready for this one? So despite all of those kind of five questions and are you five questions of are you ready, most leaders, most business leaders will say, yes, we're ready. Most customers will say, no, you're not. And, um, and so that really begs the question of how you actually do make this customer centricity um, real in your organization, the how that Brenda underlined as well. And we have more CEOs coming to Salesforce than ever before asking us this question. How do we digitally transform to, to better serve customers? And the answer, in a, in a nutshell, is not buy two new technology and pour it over old thinking, because it won't change. You cannot change if you're thinking that the technology on its own will, will change you. It won't. And the way we say it, the way kind of just to break that down is, these leaders come to us and they have kind of two ways of looking at the world. They have a, almost a renovate mindset, and that is they're looking at technology to drive cost out of the business, make things cheaper, faster, better. Everything that we've been currently doing, we need to sell more effectively, cheaper, faster, and better. And that, they're approaching the world with that renovate mindset. The world is still business, is this, the, the world and the business is still product-centric in that universe. It's just doing everything that we're doing with some new technology. And then, and that's like 95% of their, of their headspace. And then the remaining 5% of their time, in their head they're going, okay, now how do we go out and really innovate and build like the next business, the next billion dollar business? How do we go and create like the future for our business? And we call that a transcend mindset. And this is where companies go out sometimes and they go and buy a, a fintech startup or a, a, you know, a, a bleeding edge startup who's, who's doing something really interesting in your industry and go, right, how do we retrofit that into our organization? So you've got these kind of really, really different things going on in any organization. The problem with that is it is impossible for you to beat up your organization, drive cost out on the one hand, and that becomes the daily reality of your business, at the same time as try and create this new startup that's gonna transform your business. It is just impossible to bring hundreds of thousands of customers on that journey tens of thousands of employees on that journey. Bring your brand on that journey. It just won't happen. It's impossible. And that's why so many companies fail on digital transformation. Because at the end of the day, all they're doing is leveraging new technology to just keep on doing what they've always been doing. At the same time as your customer is demanding for all those things that I just talked about. So what we say is that there's actually a middle way. This needs to be like, la, um, sort of sound in the background. There is a middle way. This is movement from being product-centric to a movement to being customer-centric, and every organization can do this. And this is what we advise companies to do as they really look to change. And this is possible. This is really, really doable. But in order to evolve, you have to have a whole evolved mindset throughout your whole organization. And there are four things that we say are kind of the company-level imperative, four 
the kind of muscle groups that you've got to really work and build if you're going to be successful as a business in this new fourth industrial revolution. Now, let me briefly explain each of them, and they build on each other. The first is that your, your business processes need to be designed to be customer-centric. That means that your business process, which is predicated on selling more, which is inside out thinking, that's a sales process that's purely product-centric. What you've got to think about is what is the buying experience? What are the experiences for my customer in? I really design those in a way that truly allow you to create these experiences that your customers actually want, step one. Once you've done that, now you need to think about the team that's going to deliver on that because there's no way that your sales team or your service department or your marketing department will individually deliver on that. This is going to become a one-team effort. Anybody who's touching the customer needs to now be able to turn around and leverage the full force of your company to serve the customer's needs. That means aligning as one team around the customer. That means having a customer culture, collaboration tools across every team, and incentivizing um, a customer-first culture. The third thing you need to do, though, is then bring those business customer-centric processes uh, and, and that team alive with technology. What we can't do is just dump some technology on top of this Maya, this kind of crazy um, onion layers of old technology that you've amassed over maybe even decades. You've got to go for the leanest possible technology stack. And that means that you don't just have an IT team that does all of your technology work. You are setting people free closer to the end customer who are able to make changes in, in the technology using clicks, not code, just like our children are learning at school. That you've built reusable, modular components of data and processes so you can build it once, use it many times. These are the new ways in which uh, you'll be leveraging technology much more effectively. And many leaders are now beginning to realize that whether they're a bank or a retailer uh, or whatever, actually what they are is a technology company wrapped around a bank or a retailer. Um, and that means a significant mindset shift uh, in, in it's just the IT team's job to, to handle technology. That means your board needs to become more technology savvy as well at the same time. And if you do these first three things right, amazing customer experiences that you've designed, one team aligned around your customer, leveraging amazing technology like Salesforce. Sorry, I had to throw that one in there. Um, just for a minute, angels will sing, I guarantee you. And then something's going to happen. Your customer is going to change their, their mind, their opinion. They're going to move on to the next thing. They're going to see something else they get excited about. And here's the question, how did you even know? You don't know unless you're out there listening. You've got to sense and respond the change that's going on in, the, in your organization. Sense and respond the change that's going on out in your customers. Bring the voice of your customers back into your business and so that every department understands the change that's going on and what your customers want tomorrow, not what they wanted a year ago. So these are four things that we're seeing any successful company of tomorrow, if they're going to leverage technology to do what I'd like you to do, what Thomas Curian was talking about earlier, these are four big muscle groups that you've really got to uh, focus on working. Now, it's not just about the corporation. It's also about you as individuals. So for just for one second, to take off your hat of the company you work for and lay it on the table in front of you, um, the first person who's um, who's going to live to be over 150 has already been born. That means that the 100-year career is out there, is going to happen. Now, for many of you, that's a kind of a scary, for me, it's kind of a scary thing, but for my children, that's kind of the reality. That means that there is absolutely no way that the system of education, that as you have it in your head today, which is go to school, get your qualifications, then get a job, that is the most patently ridiculous and absurd way of looking at the world, especially in a world where technology and change is happening so fast. So in this new world, how are you looking at life as, as your uh, classroom, the job in which you're in as your classroom, and that, um, and that you're really, really aware of the fact that, that basically 60% of all the jobs that will be on the marketplace don't even exist today, haven't even been invented today. And there's certainly no way of getting trained for those yet. So we're all going to have to think about reskilling and retraining. 
and the best employers will be those who deeply understand that for them to win the war for talent, they've got to create a truly amazing human-centric employee experience, an amazing place um, to, to, to live, to learn, uh, and to work. Um, here's a quote from uh, a, a famous Englishman. If I was American, I'd have Mark Twain or somebody else up here, but excuse me for being British and bringing out old Charlie here. Um, but this is a really, really good quote. Uh, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. Are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs>